Thank you all for joining us today. Just wanted to say on behalf of the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs and the Institute of Educa International Education, we welcome and thank you for joining us. So during this webinar today, we'll be addressing various emotions that are involved in the reentry process, as well as methods for coping with those. We'll also be discussing next steps in terms of applying your study and intern abroad experience to your future career. Um, so my name is Taylor, and I'm joined by my colleagues Stephanie and Lasaya uh, from the Gilman program, as well as two of our wonderful alumni ambassadors, Chelsea and Jonathan. Um, so Chelsea and Jonathan, can you guys take a minute to briefly introduce yourself, uh, where you studied abroad, and what you're doing now? Jonathan, would you like to start? Yeah, um, so my name is Jonathan. Uh, I studied abroad in Tokyo, Japan um, at a university called Oberlin uh, University. Um, currently, I, after I come back, I graduated from community college um, in the spring of 2019. Um, from there, I decided to take a bit of a break to kind of figure out what I wanted to do for work. And um, I'm currently working as a technician at Apple. Um, and my future goal is I'm going to be transferring to the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, in the fall, and I will be continuing working with Apple. I'm going to transfer to one of their Hawaii locations. Um, and then from there, I plan on pursuing a degree in Japanese um, with hopes of either working, like taking a business experience with Apple in Japan, um, or like seeing what other types of scholar study abroad opportunities I have post graduation. Okay, great. And Chelsea? Hello, everyone. Um, again, my name is Chelsea Brown. I studied abroad um, during the summer of 2016 in Rabat, Morocco. Uh, I studied Arabic there. And um, currently, I am an analyst at the Agile Group in DC. Uh, we support Homeland Security, US Custom and Border Control. Uh, so I'm just utilizing my degree the best way I can um, with any kind of uh, national security categories in this area. All right, hi guys, this is uh, Stephanie, one of the advisors on the Gilman team, and um, I want to congratulate you guys again on winning uh, your Gilman scholarship, and you guys are now joining an alumni community of over 31,000 scholars, and there are many ways to stay engaged moving forward. Um, we'll actually be ending this webinar today with a discussion of academic and professional benefits available to Gilman alumni, as well as opportunities for staying involved with Gilman in the future. So as you guys know, re-entry can be a really emotional as well as a psychological stage of readjustment, similar to the adjustment period you experienced when you first went abroad. It occurs when you are in the process of returning to the US after time overseas and transitioning back into your home culture, personally, academically, and professionally. Many factors may have influence, may influence readjustment to your home culture, including the length of time you're away, any previous international experience that you've had, your level of contact with friends or family back at home, and whether you enjoyed your time abroad. You have likely changed because of your study or intern abroad experience. Although you may not notice these changes in yourself right away, your friends and family might see an increase in qualities such as confidence, independence, and resourcefulness. In the weeks and months that follow your return to the United States, recognizing and processing these changes can help you max maximize the impact that your experience will have on your future. While abroad, you may have viewed the US through rose-colored glasses, and it's common to make generalizations like American food is better, or the American way of doing this makes more sense to me. When you return home, it can really be shocking to find that some things do not match the impression that you had of them while you were abroad. Many students also have an expectation of total familiarity or being able to pick up exactly where they left off and things may have changed at home. Your friends and families had their own lives and things have happened since you've been gone. Essentially, students don't expect their home culture, something considered known and precious, to change without them there. So kind of to expand upon that, most people expect some, side of, some kind of culture shock at the beginning of their program when they first go abroad. 
but fewer anticipate the reverse culture shock that can often happen after you come home. Um, so just being prepared for this can help really limit its effects. In general, reverse culture shock refers to the discomfort that's associated with acclimating back to your home culture. Uh, after you've adjusted to your life in your host country, you will view the U.S. through a different lens. So upon your return, you might notice things about Americans and American culture that you didn't notice before you left. So this diagram up on the screen illustrates the stages of adjustment that are faced by most international travelers. Numbers one through five refer to stages that take place within your host country, but for our webinar today, we'll be talking about numbers six through nine, the stages that occur after you get home. So just like when you went abroad, you can expect peaks and valleys from your re-entry experience. Most people start at a high point when they're really excited to be home, to see friends and family, and to get back to that familiar routine. Um, but then you may end up feeling frustrated or lonely because those closest to you don't understand what you experienced and how you've changed. Uh, you might be missing your host culture and your friends there and also looking for ways to go back. And then gradually you'll readjust to life at home. Things will start to seem routine again, although you'll be viewing those things through a different lens, so it's not going to be exactly the same. And then finally, at the end of our chart here, you'll incorporate what you learned and experienced abroad into your new life and career. But some common signs are reverse homesickness. So just like you may have missed home when you first got abroad, you might miss your host country now that you're back. Um, frustration is another common emotion. Uh, it can be difficult to convey what you felt, learned, and experienced abroad, especially to an audience without much international travel experience. So if a relative asks you, how was Spain? It's almost impossible to distill your experience down into something bite-sized for them. Um, some tips for this are to encourage your audience to study and turn or travel abroad themselves so they can have these types of experiences. And then if you're finding it difficult to convey what you gained from your experience, uh, we recommend taking some time to write down your thoughts in order to process those better. So you can connect with others who have studied abroad recently, uh, share your stories with them, and then make sure you're listening actively when they're sharing with you. Boredom is another common challenge. Um, so while you were overseas, everything was new and different. Um, since living abroad presents just constant challenges and opportunities. And after you return home, settling back into your old routine while comfortable can also seem boring compared to your life abroad. These feelings are pretty normal, um, and one way to overcome them is by getting more involved with your local community and finding ways to stay engaged with the community that you lived in while abroad. And then one final one that we'll address is just uncertainty. So what are you going to do with all of these new perspectives and passions that you have? Um, your experience might have altered your future plans, which causes you to feel anxious, um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about those future plans and ways to really use your study abroad experience to kind of catapult you into the first stages of your career. Okay, so now we have a question for our alumni ambassadors. Um, can you share a little bit about your re-entry experience? What was challenging or unexpected? Um, Jonathan, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I think one of the first things I remember landing back in the U.S., um, was how, how, how much bigger everything was. Um, it was almost like reverse claustrophobia, where for so long I was used to living in like a compact space. Because in Japan and everything was really compact and close by. I mean, I could literally walk to the supermarket or to the convenience store. I had, a, I had built a system in my life that was very easy and convenient, at least in my mind. So I was walking everywhere and um, when I got back, I remember driving home from the airport and just feeling weird with how much space there was. It was almost uncomfortable um, how much space there was. I mean, because studying abroad for me, it, it was that thing that I had been looking for for so long, that one experience that I had been, like, that I had been striving for, and, and, it, and all of my expectations about studying abroad were met. So coming back it was frustrating and it was, it was, it was lonely. And I was like, I don't really want to be here. I don't really want to be in these big open spaces. I don't really want to eat this, you know, food that's so commercialized. I don't really want to, you know, watch the same TV shows or play the same video games that I did before. Um, so it was difficult. It, there was, you know, a, a few months period where I went back to classes and I didn't really feel motivated anymore. Um, the only thing that really, 
kept me invested was the idea of going back. Um, so that initial reentry experience for me was difficult. Um, it seems like everything in my life was kind of disappointing um, compared to how amazing my experience abroad was. Um, so if that's anything anybody feels, that's, that's pretty common and you're not alone in that. Um, and I kind of just tried to focus my energy into things that I would enjoy doing before I left. I would focus into music that I liked, to playing games that I liked, to going to familiar places um, that I used to hang out at. And that kind of helped that adjustment period. Um, but it was difficult at first, but you know, here we are now. Thank you, Jonathan. Chelsea? Uh, so for me, um, I studied in Morocco during Ramadan, which definitely was um, an adjustment and a little bit of a culture shock. However, at the time I spent there, it became very easy and almost second nature. Uh, one of the things that we did was uh, engage in a lot of excursions and some of the areas that we went to were a little bit more conservative. So I uh, became accustomed to wearing a hijab, uh, basically um, a covering. And uh, that became a part of my normal routine. Um, the outfits that I wore changed, um, how I presented myself when I was out and about to change. So when I came back to the States, uh, it felt more natural for me to continue that routine um, and be a little bit more mindful about how I dressed and what I was revealing or not revealing. Um, and it, it became a little bit difficult because um, I started to notice that this, of course, was not the norm at my university. Um, but I was able to uh, engage with our Muslim Student Association, and there I felt a little bit more at ease with dressing the way I, I now wanted to dress and engaging with people the way I wanted to engage with them, um, and just having open dialogue. A lot of people were curious about my experience. There were a lot of misconceptions, and um, of course, uh, me being the closest thing they had to knowing um, about that kind of experience, I was happy to talk to people, but I think I became a little frustrated as well, just because I felt like a lot of conversations had a lot of ignorance um, included in them. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, as long as people are willing to learn, you know, it, it was okay to expect a little bit of ignorance in the conversation as long as they're walking away with a, a different viewpoint um, because you have firsthand experiences. So it was great coming back, it was a little bit uncomfortable, but you know, everything's an adjustment when you're going from country to country, it's normal. Great, thanks you guys for sharing your own experiences with uh, re-entry. Um, and we just wanted to go over, um, kind of continuing along with that, um, give you guys some strategies for dealing with reverse culture shock and the re-entry process. Um, first, you want to say goodbye to your friends um, and plan ways to keep in touch. Um, you know, obviously a lot of you are back and for those of you still abroad, um, definitely try to schedule Skype dates to find a routine way to stay in touch in each other's lives. Um, you know, try to share your experiences with close friends. Anyone who's been abroad, even for a short period of time, knows how hard it can be to keep quiet about your adventures. But you want to be careful not to sound uh, pretentious about your stay abroad. You really want to prevent that glazed over look uh, that comes from knowing, you know, when and where your knowledge is really wanted. Um, you know, making comparisons between cultures is natural, especially after living abroad. However, be careful not to seem too critical of home or too lavish in praise about your host country. A balance of good and bad features is probably more accurate. Showing an interest in what others have been doing while you have been on your adventure overseas is the surest way to reconnect. A lot of frustration stems from what is perceived as disinterest by others in, their, in your experience and a lack of opportunity to tell your story. You know, being a good listener as well as a talker is key. You want to reflect on your time abroad. If you had a journal or a blog uh, while abroad, uh, keep posting for about a month after your return or writing in your journal. This will help you to process all that you've learned and establish next steps. You also want to take time to prepare a short elevator speech for people who ask you about your experience. It can be hard to answer, so how was your trip? In the few minutes or even seconds that a friend or colleague might offer. 
It may help to have an elevator, uh, that elevator uh, speech prepared in advance rather than settling with the usual, it was great. Try highlighting a few significant moments that stick out in your memory, such as a course you really enjoyed or your favorite aspect of your host culture. This will also help you if you feel frustrated that nobody wants to learn about your experiences abroad. Try connecting with other returnees to share insights. Some ways to connect are through online networking, your home campus, and other alumni groups. Um, definitely remember to keep reflecting on your time abroad, you know, keep writing in that journal, maybe do some worksheets. Um, you really want to also share your story through print or online media where others are eager to learn about your experiences. Um, so again, keep writing in that blog. Maybe your study abroad office has a newsletter that they put out every so often. You should definitely write for that. Um, and again, just um, ask your study abroad office if you can advise future students going to your host country. It's always great to have um, a resource uh, like you for your study abroad offices. Also, uh, share your photos uh, from abroad. You can definitely email them to us at gilmanphotos at iie.org or again, connecting with your study abroad office. I'm sure they'd love to show your photos in their office for other students as they come in. If you'd like to submit photos um, to Gilman, please don't forget to read our photo submission guidelines on the Gilman Alumni Follow-On Service Project webpage for more details. Um, and so alumni ambassadors, another question for you both. Um, after returning home, how did you guys stay engaged with your host community or how did you cope with symptoms of reverse culture shock if you went through it? Um, and Jonathan, let's start off with you again. Staying in touch with the community that I was involved with in Japan um, is actually kind of difficult because of the time difference. Um, it involved a lot of like planning ahead if we were going to try to talk on the phone or anything like that. And like you mentioned earlier, scheduling Skype dates, exactly what we had to do. Um, the intention of that was was everything. I had to I had to mark it on my calendar. They had to mark it on there and we had to set time aside to actually talk. Um, beyond like face to face conversation like that, I, I did continue like, texting them um, regularly for a very long time. In fact, there's still a few that every so often we'll, we'll have a small conversation um, online, which is the uh, app that they use. Um, another way that I, I like kind of helped with that reverse culture shock was I got involved with the Japanese community here, like locally. Um, I got involved with the like, Japanese community at my, at my community college. And there's even a few other like small things that they have. They have like a Japanese language school that is made for Japanese like Japanese American people who want to teach their kids Japanese. I got involved with that, and that was kind of a good way to like stay at least connected to that culture in a way. Um, even though it wasn't my friends that I was like comfortable and familiar with, the the culture, the way that they spoke, how they conduct themselves was very familiar, and that was exciting. It was something to look forward to. I I tried to it be very intentional about giving myself things to look forward to throughout the week, whether it be that Skype call or whether it be meeting with my Japanese friends in the state or whether it even be like putting aside, putting aside time to study my kanji or study my Japanese to keep up with that language. Um, so it, it really comes down to, to being intentional, especially I know that there's a lot of countries where the time, the time difference can be hard. Great, thanks. Chelsea? Uh, yeah, so the, the way that I was able to stay engaged uh, prior to leaving, uh, we all exchanged social media handles um, so that was um, a way for us to basically see what each other was up to and comment on certain events in their lives and just uh, be super engaged that way. Um, I think that's, I'm actually still following a lot of people that I've met while I was in Morocco, a lot of the local students and uh, some of the staff. So it, it's a great way for me to kind of um, keep in touch with them. As far as reverse cultural shock, um, the way I was able to combat that was by joining the Muslim Student Association. I just looked at uh, the different resources my university had. And uh, once I expressed uh, to the president of that organization um, about my experiences, 
they of course were so welcoming and so happy to have someone who went through the experience and was able to bring something new to the organization. Um, they actually appointed me as the liaison to the organization. So I was able to communicate uh, certain needs and um, wants of the organizations to uh, our president and uh, of our university and a couple of the student activity committee uh, folks. So that was a great way for me to combat that. I was, away, I was able to stay in touch uh, with that type of culture I became so accustomed to. Um, of course, we had a lot of events tailored towards um, the Muslim community. So I felt right at home for that. And um, to this day, you know, I still seek out opportunities to volunteer. Um, if I ever hear anyone speaking Arabic, um, I'm so willing and so happy to engage and say something. Typically, I'm met with uh, curiosity and questions, and it's always just so warm and welcoming. And people are so happy just to know that there are people going um, abroad and, you know, wanting to learn and wanting to experience their culture as well. So that's how I basically combat that. Um, so one other tip is to use your follow on service project as a way to resettle back into your campus or community. Um, and you can also use your project to help deal with some of the challenges of reentry. So one of those first, the first ways to do that is to use your follow on service project as a vehicle to tell your story. Uh, you can recount what was important for your personal, professional and academic growth while you were abroad. Um, what influenced your time abroad, who was important in your life there, or what big events happened that really shaped the trajectory for your personal, professional, and academic paths. Um, you can also integrate your specific experiences abroad to make it relevant to your target audience, whoever that may be. Um, be sure to give background information and speak to your audience as if they're stepping into your shoes. Um, so for example, if your target audience is the LGBT community on, camp on your campus, really highlight um, your experiences where you interacted with the LGBT community abroad or relevant experiences for you as a member of that community. Also incorporate others as you share your experience. So engage your audience by asking questions that show how they can also go abroad. We know that it's never too late or too early to be thinking about study abroad. And finally, please don't wait to complete your follow on service project. Uh, six months can definitely go by quickly, so it's important to get started early. And this is also key in helping with reentry. Um, so for our alumni ambassadors, how did your follow on service project help with your reentry? And did you make any adjustments to your project after returning from abroad? We can switch things up and start with Chelsea this time. Uh, so my follow up service project, I wanted to focus on some of my strengths. And um, I felt like at that time that I was uh, a pretty good writer. Um, I had, of course, been awarded the Gilded Scholarship. Uh, so I clearly was doing something right. So I wanted to turn around and help um, influence the number of minorities uh, participating in study abroad. I happened to, at the time, attend Florida a and University, which is a historically black college and university. So I was in a prime area to uh, really impact the minority community and really just share my experiences and offer some free services as far as scholarship, um, writing, some input. Um, reviews, just basically trying to utilize my writing and reading skills um, the best way I could. Um, I also went to a lot of the surrounding community colleges, um, some of the other universities throughout North Florida. Um, I was lucky enough to um, state my case to the president of my university, who um, definitely was interested in impacting the number of uh, participants uh, of study abroad in the area. So they actually backed me with that, helped me get around um, to a couple of different universities, provided some supplies. I partnered with um, our university's International Education and Development Office. Um, so that way I could be a keynote speaker and um, basically just show some of the students that I also was a student or at that moment was a student and um, I was able to do it and I was able to combat some of the hesitations that um, a lot of people in my community have as far as studying abroad. Um, so that's what kind of what tailored my follow-up service project. I still to this day um, offer free scholarship workshops um, and just try to help my um, community the best way I can uh, with combating some of those hesitations, speaking with parents, um, basically reviewing scholarship applications, do whatever I can to make sure that there are more students participating in uh, these great opportunities. That's awesome, Chelsea. Thank you. And Jonathan? And yeah, for uh, my study abroad or for my follow on service project, I worked with um, the honors program at my college. They 
had this event that they would host every semester called the Discover the World event. It was a whole day long event where students could come and they could learn about study abroad opportunities. They can learn about like, different culture uh, clubs that are on campus, like and different type of cultural community or cultural things that are happening throughout the community. Um, and so I how I gave an hour long presentation um, that was kind of like a Q and A session slash like a, a lecture about what it actually looks like to study abroad. And so I had a whole room full of, of, of people who were interested in what the logistics of, actual, of studying abroad actually were like. And it was awesome because it was like the first time since I got back and this project I think was three or four months after I got back, mind you, where I felt like people cared about what I did more than they cared about like, how was it? What was your experience like? They're like, no, what, what did you do like every day? What was your routine like? How did that, how did that affect the way you studied? How did that, how did that change your mentality? And so it's awesome. So I, I spent an hour just uh, talking to a group of students about um, what my class schedule looked like, what it, what it, how to ride the train, where I would go get food, how I would organize my study time, um, what it was like to adjust to a Japanese classroom as opposed to an American classroom. And in, in a lot of ways, it was closure in, in my mind to kind of it was it was a great way to look at the differences and, and to to be happy about those differences. And then there is a section at the end where um, the students asked me questions, and they were asking me things that I, I hadn't even thought about. It was it was really exciting to get to interact with them and then to genuinely feel engaged and to genuinely feel excited about studying abroad and to also present this to them to the lens of it being like, hey, this is something that you can do. This is possible. Um, like I was able to share share an excitement with them. And that was really cool. And beyond that, I um, also became the Japanese tutor at my college and I was able to work one-on-one -on -one with students and talk to them about what it was like to study abroad. And um, these were students that were interested in Japanese and were particularly interested in the very same program that I did. And so it was really, really cool to get to really, be really excited about it and to share with them, like, hey, this is what your classes are going to look like. This is what your entry exam is going to look like. This is how you're going to ride the bus every day. And it, it, was, it was exciting to see them then try to go for that same program that I came back from. Um, and I also, aside from tutoring, I also volunteered at the Japanese festival and was able to educate people further um, about the Gilman Project and, or I'm sorry, sorry, about the uh, Gilman Scholarship. And I was able to do a, a whole other Q&A session. And so, I just, it was nice because I felt heard and I felt understood and I felt like people were actually interested. And so what was an intimidating hour long service project became a really, really refreshing event. That's great. It sounds like you were both able to achieve really impactful follow-on service projects. So just one other tip before we move on. Um, if you're having a difficult time readjusting to life in the U.S., we encourage you to take advantage of some reflection activities that we've put together for study abroad returnees. Um, so on the alumni section of our website, which is up on the slide here, we offer a toolkit of exercises that include reflection activities, journal prompts, things like that. Um, and we've also compiled lists of resources for overcoming reverse culture shock, effectively articulating your experience, and integrating your experience into your career search with sample resume points, interview questions, and text for cover letters. So you can find those things at gilmanscholarship.org slash alumni. And then if you go to the re-entry section. So before we move on to talk about um, using study abroad in your career search, I uh, just wanted to take a minute to pause and see if we have any questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box. Okay, looks like we're good. So we can go ahead and move on. All right, so up next, we'll talk about some ways to use your Gilman experience in your future endeavors. We'll talk about some of these more in depth, but some examples include adding overseas experience and your status as a Gilman scholar to your resume, staying connected with Gilman through online networking, um, seeking an internship connected to your major and experience abroad, um, also becoming a Gilman alumni ambassador. Um, you can also try expanding on your follow on service project. As well as applying for other international opportunity and scholarships, such as the uh, Boren scholarship or fellowship or the Fulbright award. And as well as attending um, 
an in-person career development workshop for Gilman alumni. These workshops take place all over the country and travel stipends are offered. We do announce those every year in the alumni newsletter and you can sign up for the alumni newsletter in the alumni section of the Gilman website. There is a path called uh, alumni newsletter and then you can hit the subscribe button to sign up for that newsletter and there's always new information and opportunities that are advertised there. You do want to take some time to think about the skills that you've gained abroad. Um, you can incorporate these skills into your resume, your cover letter, um, and also that elevator speech that you probably want to pre-prepare. Um, some examples are included here, um, such as you're able to adapt to new environments, um, you can manage crises, um, you can operate with a high level of ambiguity, and those are just a few of those new skills and qualities that you can definitely add into your resume um, and your cover letter. Um, for the alumni ambassadors, what was the most important skill that you guys think you learned or developed abroad? And Chelsea, if you wouldn't mind getting us started. Sure. Uh, so the the most important skill I believe I learned abroad was um, self-confidence. Um, me going into a country where the the majority of the, of the people that there spoke Arabic and me knowing no Arabic, no French, just plain on English, uh, definitely was a challenge. And I had to be a little bit more confident in my abilities to acquire the language, um, to adapt, uh, to assimilate in a short period of time to basically live and really enjoy my time. Uh, besides that, I think another skill was multitasking. Um, of course, you're going to engage in a lot of excursions and there's going to be a lot of activities and it's going to be a great time. But the purpose of you being there is, of course, your studies and doing well in your studies. So I had to uh, find a way to be able to engage in all the fun activities, but also stay on top of my studies and really make sure that I'm acquiring everything I can because I knew that this would be a rare opportunity and I want to take full advantage of it. Um, so I think those are the two most important things I, I gained. And Jonathan. Yeah, um, one of the things that I keep in my little elevator speech um, is that if you know anything about Japanese culture, you know that it's completely backwards from everything we know about in the U.S. And so one of the major skills that I learned was adaptability because I got off the plane and I couldn't read anything. I couldn't understand anything. It was cramped. There was some people. Everything was moving at an extremely fast pace. There was all of a sudden a ton of cultural norms that had a lot different of a weight to them than they do here. Like cultural norms are extremely important. What side of the elevator you stand on, how you wait to get on to get on a train, how you pay at a restaurant, quite frankly, how you order, how low do you bow, when is it appropriate to cross the street? So many things that were just you wouldn't have thought were important. All of a sudden they were. They were crucial. And so I definitely learned the ability to observe and adapt. And um, with that, I also learned how to communicate because their, their social norms were different. So were their communi communicative norms. They would communicate different. They would use different hand gestures. They would use different inflections to mean different things. And it was, it was very, very difficult. And so I learned how to adapt quickly. And I learned how to communicate better, even though there were language barriers and there were cultural barriers. Thank you, guys. Um, okay, so how do we highlight those new skills that we've learned abroad in a resume? Um, so we definitely recommend adding your transferable skills from studying or interning abroad to your resume to show why you would be a valuable employee to whatever company or position, volunteer, in internship position, anything like that. Um, if your program was primarily academic, we recommend listing the program details under the education section of your resume. If your program included an experiential learning component, like an internship, work experience, or volunteer opportunity, uh, you can go ahead and include it in the experience section of your resume. You can also list leadership achievements, honors, and skills developed abroad under the appropriate headings. Add your foreign language uh, acquisition and level, as well as any other skills learned abroad to a skills section of your resume. And then don't forget to include your status as a Gilman Scholar um, under an honors or awards section, um, as well as your non-competitive eligibility status for federal jobs. 
As you're working on your resume, be sure to list your skills and experiences in a way that demonstrates how you meet the qualifications for the specific position that you're applying for. So wherever it's possible, use the exact language from the position, position description in your resume rather than rephrasing in your own words. Um, and the reason for that is that for many jobs, the first review of applicants is a digital resume scan. So if your resume doesn't include certain keywords from that description, your application won't be reviewed. <clears throat> we also advise returnees to practice answering interview questions with specific examples to show how your skills and experiences will translate into the professional world. So we encourage you to use STAR or the Situation Task Action Results approach when you're answering interview questions. Um, look at the job description and find three to four key skills or traits that are necessary for that position. And then find examples from your recent past, um, including education abroad experiences, to answer behavioral questions that show you have the skills that they're looking for. For example, if you are asked about a time that you worked with someone who did not share your communication style and how you handled, handled that situation, you could talk about your study abroad program in Chile and how you learned how to successfully communicate and complete a group project with Spanish speakers, despite the language barriers that you encountered as someone who is not native to the language. Um, so the STAR method, just in general, situation refers to just describing the context of a challenge that you've overcome, task, what was your exact role or responsibility in this situation, and what was your end goal? Action, explain the sequence of actions and your thought process for dealing with the challenge. Uh, why did you choose this method in particular over another? And then results, summarize the tangible results and the impact of your work and decisions. How were things better off because you were there? Um, it's always best to use a high level of detail and concrete evidence to show the full impact of your initiatives and using this method can really wow your interviewer um, if you're able to really pull out those skills that you you have demonstrated in the past. Okay, so another question for our alumni ambassadors. Um, how did you highlight your overseas experience in your career search and what impact did your experience have on your academic or career trajectory? Um, Jonathan, would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as far as my career search goes, I still kind of consider myself in a bit of a career search um, as I haven't really finished college and I haven't really settled into something that I think is my, my lifetime calling. But um, I do think I work in a great job. Um, I work for Apple and they're an incredible company and they have, an, they have incredible benefits and incredible travel opportunities and all kinds of things. And so having that study abroad experience really pulled through um, in my interview because a lot of the questions they would ask me are, are you, have you been faced with a really challenging situation that you didn't know the outcome to and how did you handle it? Now I'm a technician at Apple, so part of my day-to-day -day job is to assess situations and to come up with solutions and half of the problems I see are problems I am unfamiliar with. So you can see how well studying abroad fit into that. And I was able to talk about how I was able to communicate with people abroad, even though I wouldn't understand what they're talking about, or how I was able to adapt to situations when I was unfamiliar, or I was faced with ambiguity. And so that, that really showed up. And then even after the interview and after I got my job, a few months after being employed, they approached me and said, hey, we offer business experiences um, in Japan and you would be eligible for this in about a year or so. Would this be something you'd like to talk about? It's about a six month business experience where you go abroad and work with our business team. And all that came from just me having Japan on my resume and having mentioned it in my interview. And it was an incredible, the doors that it's been opening. And academically, well, academically, it did a lot. It completely, it completely changed my, my trajectory. I originally, I was just kind of going to school to go to school and not really invested in academics. But after I saw the opportunities that I had through studying abroad, it became top priority. And you know, now I've decided I'm going to continue studying Japanese and make that my major because it's been so incredibly useful in my professional work field and in my academic field. And so um, it made me decide I'm going to go to Hawaii of all places to uh, continue studying. And it made me interested in things like 
the Fulbright scholarship and, and what other opportunities there are abroad. So it absolutely, it absolutely altered my view on um, education and academia for the better. And so it's, it's been extremely beneficial and extremely incredible. And I, I look at it now as like, as a staple in my life that changed me completely. Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, Chelsea? Uh, yes, so as far as the impact on academia goes, um, I believe, similar to Jonathan, um, I was basically attending school. Um, I was, you know, going through the motions, doing what I need to do to pass the courses. But um, when I studied abroad in Morocco, um, that I, I basically had an entire 360 in my learning habits. Um, and wanting to excel in my studies, uh, I definitely became a lot more disciplined. Um, I procrastinated a lot less. Uh, I just became a little bit more focused um, and more determined to not just pass, but actually excel in the courses I was taking. So, of course, me coming back, um, I was able to fulfill a language course requirement and a professional development uh, course requirement that I needed to graduate undergrad. Um, also, me studying abroad, um, I, of course, had an interest in international affairs. So that's actually what motivated me to pursue um, the mas my master's degree in global security and international affairs, which I currently um, have now. Um, so that definitely was a huge impact on me and just how I look at my work from now on. As far as my career goes, I can confidently say, uh, me including this experience, uh, my studies in Morocco, uh, definitely is a, a huge advantage and a great talking point uh, for a lot of the companies that I was seeking upon graduation. Um, typically, they'll see that, and that's what interests them to talk to me um, versus the mass of um, applicants out here applying for the same job. Uh, so I usually lead with that experience um, because I'm in an international affairs and national security uh, type of uh, job realm. Um, this is definitely something that they're interested in. They want to learn about my Arabic courses, um, my experiences abroad. Of course, you know, a lot of companies nowadays have an uh, international aspect to them. So knowing that you have experience going abroad, um, excelling abroad, you know, working with the Gilman Scholarship, the ties that we have to the State Department, these are all great talking points and definitely something that sets you apart from the, the majority of applicants probably in the pool. Uh, so I definitely would recommend anyone to make sure that you're including it, you're highlighting it, and you're basically utilizing um, this experience the best way you can because it really does set you apart from the majority of people out here looking for jobs in that same career path. Thank you so much, guys. I think those are really helpful um, tips and um, experiences you guys shared for our um, current scholars. Um, Again, we want to remind you guys that there are actually a lot of benefits and resources available to you as Gilman alum. Um, so again, stay updated on a lot of um, new opportunities by subscribing to that, um, to our alumni newsletter. And again, to subscribe and learn more about other opportunities for alumni, um, you definitely want to vi uh, visit the alumni section of our Gilman website. Um, also, um, as a reminder, as a Gilman Scholar, as you heard Chelsea discuss, you have a non-competitive eligibility hiring status for federal jobs, and that really means that you can be hired outside of the normal competitive process. So instead of being in a large pool of applicants, you are actually pulled into an, a smaller pool, so you have greater chances of being hired um, in a federal uh, position. Um, we also recommend that you network online with other Gilman alum in our closed Facebook and LinkedIn groups. These can be great resources for staying connected, mentoring new Gilman scholars, as well as leveraging the Gilman network for professional development. Often alumni or Gilman staff members will post relevant jobs to these uh, group pages as well. Um, we also have an archive of webinars on that alumni website on topics like opportunities to go abroad again, how to use your NCE or your non-competitive eligibility hiring status, and leveraging LinkedIn in your career search. Um, 
And finally, the Gilman program partners with higher education institutions across the U.S. every year to offer in-person professional development seminars for Gilman alumni. Um, and again, we announce these on our website, social media, and alumni newsletter. Great. So before we end our webinar today, I just wanted to check, are there any questions? Um, if you have any questions for us or our alumni ambassadors, please feel free to just go ahead and type those into the chat box. Um, if there are no questions, I just want to thank our alumni ambassadors for joining us today and for sharing all of your wonderful experiences and all of your advice for our current Gilman scholars. Um, we encourage you to keep in touch. Here's our contact information. Um, remember that your contact with the Gilman program doesn't have to end with when your follow-on service project is done. We love to hear from Gilman alum on about what you're doing now and how you're using your study abroad experience later on down the road. So please feel free to keep in touch. Um, we'll also be sending out a follow-up email with a recording of the webinar and a link to further resources. Um, most of those, again, on the alumni section of the website. So uh, if there are no questions, then we'll just uh, end our webinar today. Thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.